Hi392 here yet for another video which you'll probably get sick of this intro within the next five minutes. Anywho, now the follow-up to the 1HD FTE video is obviously the 1VD. I've been planning to do the 1VD project for I think six months actually but I didn't have a 1VD sort of a donor car I could use to sort of film so I had to substitute with the 1HD which turned out to be the happy mistake that Let's just say it definitely helped me in in some ways. I'm forever grateful for you guys for watching, for all 30,000 of you. And counting! That's the funny part. Anyway, back to the 1VD story. Now, the 1VD, as you may know, is a 4461cc or 4.5 liter twin turbo diesel V8. Now, this is Toyota's first and, so as far as I know, the only turbo diesel V8. It's kind of like Toyota's version of the Chevy Duramax, the L5P. But the difference between the L5P and the 1VD is, well, for one, the 1VD has a lot more, is a lot more compact in terms of its engine size, not the physical size because the bloody thing has 90 degree V8s and has double overhead cams, which is a complicated engine setup, let's just say the least, but it's still pretty reliable. They're primarily used in two cars, the VDJ79 and the VDJ200 or the 200 series. Or you could also call it the Super King here because local people enjoy putting Ninja King, Ninja and then Super King. It's how they do it. I don't know what they're going to do with the J300 series Land Cruiser, they're going to call it probably the Super King or the Mega King or something like that. Uh, nomenclature. Don't at me. Anywho, the 1VD. It's an interesting engine design. It, it is, of course, the successor to the 1HD FTE. Now, in this video, we're gonna try and debacle why people say certain things about the 1VD, as well as some technical specs, as well as some race footage. Now, for the next part of these uh, videos, it will be as a voiceover because I'm not able to use said 1VD vehicle because the owner is kind of cagey about it, so Best I can do is just film the B-roll and uh, slide in some slideshows. It's it's gonna be George Russell's uh, six, uh, George Russell 63's uh, interpretation of an engine uh, engine. Really helpful tool. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the voiceovers of me talking complete gits worth on the 1BD, aka the Zatong Slapper. Now, if you're not from Australia, you'll probably be wondering what the hell does the nickname Fong Slapper mean? Now, Fong Slapper in Australia means first, Fong in Australia means sandals. Slapper obviously means slapping each other, which means you get this sound effect. Add that multiple times and played at a couple thousand RPM, you'll get what a 1VD sounds like with a exhaust on, especially if you bash it on the limiter. Now we shall start with the engine block. Now the engine block for the 1VD FTV is made of compacted vernicular graphite cast iron. God, I can't believe I said that in one go without multiple tries. Now this material... Uh, this car isn't an anorak. It's where people who make anoraks go to buy their anoraks. From that and look at the exterior. Now the exterior of the block looks pretty stout. It has very thick ribbing around the head studs, which is a very good thing because if you know anything about engines with small head studs, if you push a lot of boost through them, they have this tendency to lift the head, which leads to head gasket issues, which is not exactly good if you want to tow heavy things as well as 
do a little bit more right foot happy moments. Now the the bore for the 1VD is surprisingly not Siamese board like the old 1HD setup was. Probably due to cost reasons because the engine was released back in 2008 and in 2008-2009 they were already cutting down cost due to a, multi a multitude of reasons and the Okay, there's been a financial crisis. Is it the first time you've heard of it? <laughs> Next good part about the 1VD's block is, of course, the rotating assembly uh, setup. Now, not the actual rotating setup, but the block reinforcement structure. The 1VD also retains uh, the old FTE's a Fable integrated main cap brace. Obviously, a different shape to this engine, obviously. Now, this little improvement has brought along block structural rigidity, which means there's not a lot of block twist, which is a very good thing when you're pushing stupid amounts of power. Now, power is going to be a very sort of common occurrence in this video because this engine really does put power down if you know what you're, what you're doing. The 1VD's um, integrated main crap brace at the bottom has bolts that lock into the main caps and are made of high grade plastic to reinforce these bearing caps so you won't do a Mitsubishi 4G 63 2G thing of crank walking insert video of a crank walking 4G 63 here moving on from that we shall tackle the pistons con rods as well as the crankshaft the 1VD's pistons are made of aluminum alloy aluminium to Americans the benefits of an aluminium piston is of course uh, heat dissipation. When you can dissipate heat as quickly as possible, it means that the piston doesn't overheat which leads to uh, a ballooning of the bores when they get too hot. And what leads to that means an engine rebuild because eventually they'll get stuck and they'll cause all sorts of havoc. Now the benefits of this piston, specific piston design, well now we shall look at it from the top. Now, the 1VD features different pistons as, as always. They have four ports. Now, these four ports at the top are what I thought to be gas ports are actually because it, of the influence of uh, emissions of Euro 4 standards back in 2008. If they had to start this engine in a car over there, they had to design it. With that being said though, the benefits of this sort of tight tolerances has meant that the engine is a lot more fuel efficient as well as more efficient thermally. Which means that you can push a lot more horsepower from this thing and torque because diesels love torque. It's, it's their forte. Anywho, when you flip the piston over, you will see two sort of oil journals. Now these have the same philosophy to the previous engine. This is to allow oil to enter the galley of the piston, which has the adverse effect of cooling the, uh, the pistons, which leads to better uh, shelf life for these, uh, for these engines. But the other benefit to that is, of course, you could squeeze way more power and not have to worry about combustion temperatures as well. If you look at the block from the underside, you do see these are the oil skirters at the bottom. Now these oil skirters tie in with the oiling system to shoot engine oil to cool the pistons. Now the pistons have two ports, one of them is probably for entry, one's for exit, which means that the quicker you get the, oil, uh, the hot oil out as well as cool oil in, which means that you can squeeze a lot more power as well as it being more thermally efficient, which is a real benefit. Now when you flip it back to a sort of table height position. If you see on the gudgeon pin or the crown or where uh, where the crown is, you'll see this sort of resin-esque coating to the side of the piston. Now that resin coating has the another benefit of uh, cooling the piston as well, which you can put two and two together which means extra boosties. We move on to the connecting rods of said FTV. Now the FTV has a high strength steel con rod which is very vital when it comes to taking these sort of uh, combustion pressures. If you look at a 1VD's uh, peak combustion pressure, this is about 175 megapascal for the Euro spec, uh, UK spec Land Cruiser 4.5 D4D. To give you a 
bit of perspective of how high that combustion pressure is. The old FTE's peak was about 35,000 kilopascals. Now, if you do rough, simple math, the 1HD FTE only has to do with about 20% of the combustion pressure. That is like a four-fold jump in terms of uh, uh, combustion pressures. Now, the reason for that is, of course, emissions. Because you must run this engine leaner, which means you always will encounter higher combustion pressures. Anywho, the structure of the 1VD Conrods is a H-beam profile. Kind of like the old engine, but it has improvements such as in the big end bearing department. They probably learned their lesson with the old 1HDT setup. The big end bearings are now secure with this nutless tightening bolt, which if you don't do anything and you know regularly service it and not be a complete gronk about it, it is a peach. Now the crankshaft of the FTV is another quality moment for Toyota. The design is basically what they took a one good look at Ayers Rock like, hmm, let's build that, but apply that principle to the engine. Now the forged steel crank is a solid chunk. Now this features seven balance weights to counteract the uh, sort of engine harmonics that comes with a V-type diesel engine. It's not going to be as smooth as a turbo six like the old FTE was, but in terms of trade-offs with power, it was probably a good decision on their part. Not to mention packaging and all those little kooky little bits of engineering that you know everybody glosses over when they talk about engines of days. The other sort of weird new weirdness between the auto and the manual version of this engine is of course in the flywheel situation. Now the auto version of the uh, 1VD, the twin turbo one you find in the 200, has one bigger balance weight added to the flex plate side of the automatic transmission, whilst the 79, the VDJ, has a smaller balance weight added on the flywheel side of the engine, also the same as the flex, uh, flex plate side. Now the 1VD also introduced al aluminum bearings as well as an improved crankshaft pin and journal fillet design that has been hardened uh, with induction before being installed on the engine. We'll move on to the unsung hero of any engine, the oiling system. Now the oiling system in the FTV it isn't as uh, over the top let's say of the old 1HD setup with this massive journal that's placed in the block between the cylinder head and the cylinder block. They're significantly smaller. Hell, they remind me of RD28, which is significantly smaller. But to compensate for that, the oil cooler for this uh, this year engine is not integrated to the side of the block no more because they thought of a more modern design. They decided to put the oil cooler to run off the engine. Uh, which is driven off the crankshaft by this uh, this year external oil pump where they have this oil cooler that is relatively small that's placed outside and away from the engine to cool off the uh, the engine block now it may be small but it does just enough to uh, keep this engine happy so it doesn't do a TD40 uh, we then proceed to the fuel system for the 1VD now the 1VD is of course a radical changeover from the 1HDs. The old 1HDs had this sort of mechano fuel pump that's assisted with an electronic uh, setup that was pretty good actually. It's still to this day still a very competent setup. But they had other plans so they introduced the common rail injection setup to the 1VD. Now I'm not gonna even attempt to explain what common rail is. Even though common rail as a system is a lot more simple visually compared to say the old mechano fuel pump setup because that one truly is uh, mind-boggling. Now, now the, the 1VD has also another change for the twin turbo as well as the single turbo variants 279 that is. The single turbo 79 gets a less efficient fuel injector that is but it's still better than the old 4.2's injector by a long way. The 1VD uh, single turbo has a nozzle tip of 0 0.1, 1, uh, 0.105 millimeters, whereas the 200, which is the twin turbo big bad boy automatic 6B car, 
has a injector that has a smaller point of 0.113 millimeters. Now that sort of eight nine millimeter uh, eight ish or seven ish millimeters may not seem like a lot in terms of uh, physically. It's probably less than the strand of my hair. The differences in when they in introduce the fuel as well as injection pressures is astounding. It's com it's like worlds apart. The 1VD has sort of three primary issues that sort of fl uh, drag it down slightly compared to the old engine. One of it is uh, dust, oil, as well as the EGR system. We'll tackle the fuel first because that's easier. Now the fuel system is quite sensitive so if you let's say fill up your uh, VDJ79 in some some remote place somewhere please be aware of the sort of fuel quality you're getting that's why people run big long ranger tanks in the back of their cars these engines are quite sensitive if they get a little bit of dirty oil they'll just flash this engine light annoyingly every single time now if you inject enough of that dirty fuel into the engine this will lead to quite a bit of clog up of the engine which leads to all sorts of bad things which eventually culminate in an engine rebuild and nobody wants an engine rebuild on this engine because even a 79's uh, sort of engine is costly to say the least now the next thing is the airbox it's well documented that the, 79, uh, the VDJ79 airbox is not really as tight as they say it is the 79's airbox uh, has this frequent issue of letting dust in even though you've cl clamped it down it goes into the engine and what happens with dirty dust and sort of other sort of polymers that don't get filtered out when they combust they cause all sorts of havoc which means that all the sediments that's on top of the engine after the combustion leads to all sorts of problems eventually becomes soot and all sorts of havoc breaks loose the final problem with these engines is of course the EGR setup now the EGR system on the 79s was introduced back in 2016 that was the first year they introduced it now I haven't seen many sort of people complain about the 2016 even though most people say do your best to buy an old 2015 or 14, even though the 16 has a better fifth gear uh, for the engine. Now we've gone up to uh, business class. Now we've gone to the cylinder head program. Now the cylinder heads of the 1BD is made of aluminum alloy. Now the benefits of said aluminum alloy is of course better thermal properties, which means if you push this engine under high stretches like towing a trailer and towing a van, it will not warp the head, which is a very good thing to have because a warped head could really screw your day up. Now the now, 1VD features double overhead cams as well as four valves per cylinder for each bank, obviously. Now the head flow for this engine is not going to be an issue because it doesn't isn't restricted to this uh, sort of cam and block setup you would see in let's say an LS even though an LS breathes exceptionally well for what it is. Now the cams themselves for 1VD, we'll start with the intakes. The 1VD features 199 degrees intake camshafts for the intake whereas the exhaust is a 233 degrees uh, exhaust duration cam from factory. Now physically when you look at the cams from the top they're relatively modest they're not as racy as the old 1HD was but with a little bit of cowboy tuning you could get them to sound like an old muscle car like let's say a 440 uh, Mopar big block but of uh, turbos the turbos for the 79 and the 200 isn't as hard to distinguish like the old 1HD FTE days now the 200 runs to win RHV4 aka IHI VB36 and VB7 uh, VB37 turbos whereas the 79 runs a single GTA 2359V turbo now both of them 
are VNT turbos, which is a very good thing for these turbo diesels because you can physically manipulate the exhaust housing which makes them really responsive down low and can breathe a lot better up top. Now both of them of course run an air to air intercooler at the top, much like you would find on let's say a WRX STI at the top of your engine bay, which is fine most of the time until you really really squeeze power. That's where you have to, like every Subaru owner, move that intercooler from top mount to front mount. We of course move on to the tuning scene for these things. Now if you've been living under a rock or you live in America where this engine doesn't exist or maybe in say Southeast Asia where most of the 79 here is on the Japanese spec GRJ 79s, you're probably missing out on a brilliant engine. Now, the aftermarket scene, of course, you could go from mild to wild, and I'm talking very wild. The 1VD has achieved quite a lot of success, not just in like your traditional forms of drag racing and all that, but it's also achieved significant amounts in the rally scene. Now, when Toyota enters their sort of rally cars into the Dakar Rally, with the Toyota Land Cruiser platform, they always choose the turbo diesel. That's what happened with the old 100 series. Watch the 100 series uh, history walkthrough to get the scoop of that. As well as the VDs. Oh. If you're the owner of a 79 series or a 200 series, you're probably going to be looking into, you know, giving this car a little bit of a tickle uh, to satisfy your power junkie needs. Now, there are three main options. First, we'll start with Wild, and then we'll go to Wild, then Wild Ass. The first is Mild. Now, the first sort of things to do on a VD owner's list is probably a Unichip tune. Now, it frees up quite a bit of horsepower, considering that the stock tune makes about 430 Newton meters for the 79 and 650 Newton meters on the 200. Now, these engines are sort of sandbag from factory like most engines do to increase reliability and reduce parts breakages. Now of course you could go a step up to the aftermarket turbos. The first one of them that springs to mind for most VDJ owners is of course G-Turbo. They're quite popular down in Australia and even in parts of uh, Saudi Arabia or slash the United Arab Emirates. Well, now of course you can go a step higher if you're into like the WAORC you could build a 5.1 liter stroker kit for these 1VD FTVs. Now it's also built by a company called uh, Diesels Unlimited as well. They also make the 1HD 4.5 stroker I mentioned in the old 1HD video. Quality piece of kit all I can say. And if you pair that 5.1 liter and the G5 pair of G500s on the 200 it's it's she's a rowdy beast. Now, if you're not interested in, let's say, touring or slash, you know, kicking rooster tails in Morton Island or slash some uh, some other parts of the country, you may be interested in going drag racing. Now, going drag racing isn't like a weirdo sort of kitsch. You see, one k people with one KDs in Thailand do that as well. Now, if you're chasing one VD. You know, drag racing time, you've got some uh, catching up to do. The current record is at 860 or 870 ish, with GSL Fabrications holding the title right now with their single cab 79. Now, if you enjoyed the video, please click the like and subscribe button. I'm not gonna put the stupid ding bell on the, uh, on the bottom because I know some of you may not be interested in that. Also, a little disclaimer to you guys, I don't generally upload every, you know, every couple of so weeks. These sort of projects take a couple of months to produce, and I mean two months, which include research, filming, finding the right donor card, and all that uh, nonsense. So uh, I advised you guys to be, uh, please be patient with my, uh, my sort of, you know, video release schedules, and uh, I thank you guys very much for watching. Also, I would like to extend a big... Uh, thank yous to these legends on the screen right now that uh, have either helped or slash given me permission to use their video clips or slash images from the for uh, for the video's purposes. 
Now go check them out. I'll list out their social media followings or slash their their respective websites. Uh, give them a tickle or slash a follow. These guys do a brilliant work, and they shit sure as shit know a hell of a lot more than me. So, anyways, uh, signing off then. Thanks, everyone.